just a little bit of context around uh, what Equiduct is. Um, Equiduct is a regulated market as defined by MIFID and it is a market segment of the Borsa Berlin. As a regulated market new entrant, <coughs> we had to look at what we were going to do with the um, introduction <coughs> of MIFID and how we could make ourselves different. And how we did that is by focusing purely on the retail investor community we feel have not been fully addressed and looked after with the introduction of MIFID. So what we, we looked at is that the, that retail investor community does not have the resources or the technology capability to go and introduce new solutions to a, uh, access all of that new fragmented liquidity. So what we did is, um, as Equiduct, is we decided to pull in all of those level two and level one prices from all of the venues that trade our 1500 strong stock universe into a virtual consolidated order book. So that means for us, we pull in data from the LSE, from Euronext, from Zetra, from the Swiss exchange, from the Milan Stock Exchange, and also the MTFs that have popped up, Bats, Chikes, and Turquoise since the introduction of MIFID. So all day long, we put in <coughs> tick by tick data from those venues into a virtual consolidated order book. And what we do is when we receive retail order flow into that retail partner X service is that we price each individual order at the microsecond of reception on the basis of what would happen if it were to be addressed to that virtual consolidated order book. So we receive the orders, we calculate the volume weighted average price on the basis of this constantly updating full depth of uh, virtual order book in real time, create that execution. The opposite side of that transaction is supported by our liquidity providers who are members of the platform and then the trade is made on the regulated market and, and passed out through to the post-trade environment. What we also do with that data in real time is we create a virtual consolidated order book as I mentioned and from that we've managed to um, derive some additional value as well as meet our regulatory requirements for pre-trade transparency and, and by producing a data product called the market by limit feed. The market by limit feed is the top 10 price levels from all venues around Europe for a given stock with the volumes aggregated at each of those top 10 price levels. So during the day, we, we pull in all these prices, we use it for execution price determination and we generate a real time data product to be shipped out to our customers, to our data vendors, to the um, retail brokerages who then onward play that to their online retail brokerage community to consume and use and actively trade and access um, our platform, which is the first one to produce a um, MIFID compliant best execution service. In terms of numbers of, of, of data, in 2011, when <coughs> our stock universe was 1,200 stocks, and this is equities and not necessarily the Oprah feed with, with um, options and so on, um, we consumed 750 million messages per day on an average day with microbursts of 250,000 messages per second. So that's a huge amount of data to process in real time. And because of the value we derive from that, both in the data product and the execution service, the granularity of that data, because the, the books are constantly updating is important, and also the quality of that data is paramount. If we detect in real time, which, which we're obliged to do, any data inconsistency, any data errors, and any, any data quality problems, then we have to pull that source of information immediately from the execution price determination process and from the market data process and, of course, inform the users about that change. So you've got three different business models there and you've got the complicated process of producing an EBBO. So we've heard about it from a business level. We're in a technological stream here, or a technology stream even, um, if I get my teeth in. And what sort of solutions have you had to put in place? Have you had to buy new technologies? Have you been able to buy some technologies and then customise to be able to, to create uh, the right outcome for, the, for your business needs? Or, or what have you done to, to be able to do that? Uh, it was a mix to, to hop back to the first panel of the morning in terms of buy versus build because of our unique um, proposition, our unique selling point in, in Partner X and the best execution service, we've actually deployed our own software to consume and source that data. In terms of uh, storing that data and analyzing that data, we have a huge tick data store going back to 2008 with all of the trade prices and all of the level two order books, which we use for back testing, market abuse detection, market surveillance, um, we, we've employed a CEP technology from off the shelf, which allows us to uh, cross-section and uh, analyze the data 
according to our needs to do back testing, business development, trialing, uh, and, and so on. And in particular, of, of strategic use has been um, running uh, market analysis to work out how our members can trade more efficiently on the platform so we can have educated conversations with them about how they trade on the platform, how they could better trade, and also use that in the context of the wider market because we actually have everybody else's data as well. So there are, I mean, there are lots of sort of new technologies out there, the, the solar cards, the FPGAs. Have you had to go down that sort of route or, you know, what have, you, have you used any of that or have you used something else? So for the actual sourcing of data, we use a, a third-party vendor. Mm -hmm. they, they have all the challenges of the individual exchanges changing data feeds and so on, and they have the challenge of um, getting new networks in place to make sure that the latest route from here to Frankfurt is, is something that we gain immediate mm -hmm. advantage of over their multicast mesh network. At the, on our side of the fence, on Equiduct, uh, we employ standard uh, one gig technology. We will be moving to 10 gig this year. Uh, so far, we've managed to put in place several 10 gig, uh, one gig lines, sorry, to, to our data vendor. At the um, network level, we use standard networking kit so far. Um, we use a variety of techniques at the, the server level in terms of uh, looking towards TCP offloading, CPU binding of, of uh, interrupt threads to particular CPUs and operating system scheduling to separate separate CPUs and cores as well. But at the networking level so far, um, we haven't uh, b needed to employ any of the brand, brand more new technologies such as InfiniBand and so on uh, to, to get the needs. So as we head towards rapidly June 2014, that rapid train to MIFID 2. Um, I know some of the exchanges that may or may not be, be sat in the, the room here may have new obligations around uh, data reporting or usage of data, particularly if they've got stocks that are listed elsewhere. Are, are, there, ch are there any sort of challenges that you think that you should highlight to people in terms of you know, those solutions that you've put in place, but what were the sort of biggest challenges that you had um, and, and what lessons could be learned for, for some of the people in the audience? In terms of new reporting obligations, the, the challenge is always how you store that data, lo looking towards the data requirements both today and how they might develop with regulation developing so quickly, it's hard to even imagine sometimes what you're, you're going to need to have to do. So for us, um, we would redeploy the design pattern we use for storing our tick data, which was to, to use it in a, a, in a tick database which allowed us to then re-aggregate and re-cross-section re that data to give us different views to then go on and do different, different styles of reporting. Now with our panel version, has anybody got any questions before we bring the next victim up to the stage? Graham, please say your name and, uh, well, we obviously know his name's Graham, but full name and where you're from. Yeah, hi, um, Graham Dick from uh, Bats Chayix. How do you deal with um, time stamping issues um, with data coming in from all sorts of different sources, particularly the more distant locations in Europe, such as Stockholm, etc., where clearly it's going to be a different time stamping uh, timing to uh, those sourced in London? Absolutely. The, the, the question of a synchronized uh, atomic clock to be reused by all venues is, uh, is, is, is a hot topic of debate. Um, what we do practically today, in the absence of that, uh, we timestamp the data as we receive it and when we are doing our, our back testing analysis for example when we're trying to pinpoint when a trade actually occurs we look at the change in the level two market depth because often exchanges only put trade timestamps down to a second granularity we can actually observe when uh, the change in the level two data actually occurred which correlates to that exact trade so with lit order book trading we're able to get then a microsecond timestamp from that um, source venue and then we use that to normalize across all of the venues. It has to be said that for uh, Equidix Retail Best Execution Service it is what, what I like to call a, a point in space analysis so w we give you the execution price that you get at the time of data receipt of that data in our data center in interaction in London. <coughs> so we aggregate it at that point in time and it's as though you were to have made that trading decision at that point in time based upon the view of the, of the data that you can have coming into you at, at, in that location in London. Do you think, do you think um, atomic clocks are something that the industry has time to solve or has the, the money to solve at the moment or, or do you think there are too many other things for, for the industry to have a sort of standard clock at the moment? I think, I think it's an important problem to solve but there does um, seem to be 
much more um, pressing matters on, on the agenda, with, especially with the, with the new regulations that are coming to play. Uh, we, as, as Equidit, certainly would adhere to any standards, but we're not uh, uh, right now at the place where we want to drive and push for that particular problem to be solved. We, we believe there's other things we'd, we'd, we'd like to push forward um, in the meantime, which is uh, the focus on best execution, which seems to have been missed so far from MIFID 2. Well, I'm now going to invite to the stage Mr. Uh, Mark Scully, who's head of IT at the Irish Stock Exchange. Many of you may know Mark. He's very, very instrumental and is a leading member of uh, FASI, where he's been led, where he's led many of the market initiatives on the MMT, on the market uh, model topology. Um, in terms of what he's done in terms of the Irish Stock Exchange, he's been there for the last 15 years. He's been responsible for many of the data-centric projects, including the IAC Zetra rollout and also the X, uh, EX Stream uh, project, which is the listing approval service. So welcome, uh, Mark, to the stage. Thank uh, you. Not a panel virgin, so we can be a little bit rougher with you. Is that right? Yeah, you can be kind as well. We can be kind. Yeah. We can be kind as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can think about some questions for, for, for Mark, at, uh, Mark in a moment. So for, for you guys, you are an original listing exchange, which means that you have a primary market as well as a secondary market to look after. So you will have data implications on both sides uh, for, for the IEC. Do you want to talk about uh, your usage of data and also how it affects both sides of the market? Certainly, yes. Um, the, the exchange has been around since 1793 and we, our, our business model absolutely does include traded markets in, a la what most people have been talking about to date. But it also includes very much the primary market activity. So for example, in the, in the listing of specialist funds, there are over 7,000 fund classes listed on the ISE. We will be recognized as a world leader in the listing of hedge funds. From the point of view of specialist debt vehicles, particularly in the asset-backed space, we'd be uh, very prominent in Europe with over 21,000 instruments there. So, you know, out of 28,000 instruments, less than 100 of them are traded on the active secondary market. 20 7,000 plus are, are primary market listings. So when it comes to the data and it comes to the technology that supports that data, um, th there, are, there are kind of two different agendas you have to work to. And from a technology point of view, when you think about build or buy, um, th there are so many excellent secondary market infrastructures out there that you can avail of. Um, it wouldn't make any sense for the ISE to be going and building our own trading system. And we've been using the Deutsche Börse Zetra system since June of 2000, very successfully. We're currently in the process of prolonging that agreement as well. We've, we've um, had a very successful partnership with them for many years. But when it comes then to the, to the primary market business and the data that's involved, the importance of the specialism in that area to our business model, the expertise that we would have employed in our, in our people and our, and our, our technologists, um, were very much a build in that area. Right. So, for example, the, where in, in the equity trading space, you're dealing with orders, quotes, uh, trades, indices, aggregations, etc. And in the primary market, you're dealing with reference data, you're dealing with um, documentation, so prospectus, financial reports. Uh, on the compliance side, you're dealing with financial reports and company announcements, which are being received and published mm -hmm. every second uh, on the investment fund space, it's, it's net asset values, which are, uh, once again, it, it, it's, it's almost a second by second technology business, um, but the valuations themselves are net asset values out of, as of a point in time, usually the close of business the previous day. Um, so th so it's, a, it's a wide mix of technology and data spread over multiple business models. It sounds like you've invested heavily, particularly in EXtreme and the, the primary listing. Do you think that's given you an edge over, um, you know, over other exchanges? And have you seen people wanting to come and list? Uh, you know, has it given you that that edge as a listing market? You know, we heard yesterday in, in one of the panels that actually, you know, some of the Russians preferred to use other. Um, other venues to list rather than rather than listing, say, you know, in, in their home market to, to start with. But given the investment that you've given in technology, do you think that's been a, you know, a, an enabler for you guys? A absolutely. Um, like anything, th there's a context there. 
Uh, Xtreme is a second generation e-listing platform. We have invested a lot of our time and technology and efforts in it, but also our, our opportunity cost of investing in that um, clearly aligns with the business priority of the primary markets to our business model. Now, um, if, if you say, well, are people, are issuers coming to the Irish Stock Exchange because of Extreme, they probably don't know it exists. When an issuer is picking a listing venue, they're, they're concerned about the, the listing itself, what's the quality of the reputation of the listing venue, what are the turnaround times in being able to get an idea, a, a investment idea from concept to actually out in the market so that you can reach your customers, what are, is the expertise of the listing venue, what is the price model of the listing venue, um, and of course what are the actual listing rules that, that the listing is going to be put up against. Um, Extreme enables the ISE to be able to guarantee turnaround times. It, it enables us to manage our information and our customer base very successfully. It ensures that our um, expert team are not spending their time um, worrying about process and paper and collection. It mm -hmm. is about what is the investment? Um, where does this fit into the big picture? How can we offer an improved service to our customers at all times? So could you see yourself just as, as, as many exchanges sell their underlying um, architecture to other exchanges to take, do you think you could see yourself selling that as a service, you know, so people could white label, as it were, that product, you know, say, say some of the agent exchanges or some of the sort of new and up-and-coming exchanges? A absolutely, and not only can we see that happening, it, it has happened to a degree, but not to other exchanges. Um, from the point of view of the, the prospectus directive, 2005, um, there was a delegation <coughs> that, that allowed central banks to delegate the authority for approving prospectuses to exchanges if they wanted to take it up. We did. During that period, we built Extreme. When that delegation ended at the end of 2011, the Irish Central Bank had to take back the prospectus review function. We worked with them continually through 2009 until 2011 to get their people up to speed and understand the business model and the customers, but also to adopt their technology. So while we have the Irish Stock Extreme, Extreme platform in the Irish Stock Exchange, there is a prospectus directive Extreme platform in the Irish Central Bank. Right. And on top of that, we're, we are building additional change controls for them, additional um, functionality to allow them adopt other regulatory uh, obligations such as to um, transparency directive, etc. So yes, we, we have employed extreme and third party locations and we are very much looking at to see where else can this be used as um, a product or an additional service. So getting down to the sort of nuts and bolts around uh, data management, if we have a look at sort of enterprise data management, you know, is it useful? Is there a value to it? You know, have you used it? You know? uh, absolutely. Um, I think there's no question it has a value. I think one of the biggest challenges with enterprise data management is getting the political buy-in at a business level over, over data itself. So data can be, is valuable from the point of view it can get you revenue, of course. It can reduce cost. It can be either a barrier to entry or a competitive advantage. It can provide you flexibility. It improves your, uh, your reputation. It can deal with regulation, etc., etc. IT people generally notice, people who are analysts generally notice, trying to get that onto the political agenda so that people, the, the business accepts that this is a strategic imperative, taking it from there into putting in governance in place to get people trained, getting it onto their agendas for success, putting in the reporting mechanisms, all has to happen in conjunction with designing your systems, so be it um, quality controls, be it publication mechanisms, be it receipt mechanisms, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is that the same for you, David? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> as a smaller organization, we don't potentially have some of the challenges that larger organizations do. Um, so gold sources of information, of instrument and, and participant reference data is much easier for us to manage, but uh, we do that in a way that, that it's scalable. And again, we, we also use um, our reference data repositories alongside our CEP tick data store repositories to allow us to access and cross-section uh, that data in, in a way that's strategically useful to the business. 
So, it's supposed to be a lively debate. Hands up from the floor. I'll have to start pulling out names again. Come on, Graham, I'm sure you've got another question in you there. Peter? Can't ask a question. Oh, there we go. <laughs> we like to get the debate going. <laughs> What's your favourite colour? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just, just uh, uh, It's not a technology <laughs> question, right? It's not a technology question. But I've heard it twice today, and, I, and I'm a, a little perplexed, shall we say. I heard it first in the session downstairs that Christian Katz was speaking. And Christian said, with some degree of pride, you know, we have been in exchange since 1818. And you said, we've been in exchange from se since 1793. What relevance is that? Well, I suppose it's, it, there, it shows that there is a continuity, there is a legacy, there is a pride, there is a, a, an infrastructure and a business model that is ingrained in the location, in the people, in the business, um, from the point of view of where any business, of course, um, relies on other businesses to support it and for, to do business with, they are also mature of that level. So it's not like the stock exchange was on its own in 1793. <coughs> so it does show a certain amount of um, a, a certain amount of depth to what we're about. We're not just there to deal with um, the specific opportunities and challenges of today. We're also there to deal with the the areas that we find important over the period that we've been in time. We've been around. So, like, f from, from myself, um, I, I understand that um, an exchange has, ha has many roles other than, pro than providing a trading system. We're also there to enable listed en entities to become listed so that they get the recognition, they get the marketing. They're also there to raise capital. From the point of view of looking at the Irish Stock Exchange, um, if we just take 2011, 35 billion was raised um, in, uh, sorry, uh, 10 billion was raised in 2011. That's not an awful lot of money for on, on a large scale for a lot of countries. For Ireland, that is a lot of, uh, it is a lot of money. If you look at what we've been doing for over the period of the country, then the, the overall benefit that the stock exchange has provided to Ireland over that period of time is significant. But I think you, 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 we'd have to say of that 10 billion, that most of that was rights issues. How much of it was new money for new technology startups, for new enterprise businesses, et cetera, et cetera? Because, I mean, if you look at the, the numbers for Euronext in 2010, I think I'm right in saying, Euronext raised a grand total of 400 million across their entire network. But what all, all of this does, Peter, is it brings us back to the question about the panel debate about, you know, whether it's rights issues, whether it's corporate issues, there's a huge amount of, of data uh, running around the, around the system. We should just give David the chance to answer the, the question from the floor. Does age matter when you're in exchange? As, as an exchange, I, I guess it gives the, the, the view of... As a venue, I will, I'll rephrase it then. As a venue, um, <laughs> I guess it gives a view of longevity. Um, the boss of Berlin, our regulated entity, has been around for 323 years, but uh, <laughs> as, a, as a, the CEO there likes to, likes to talk about as well. Um, we were conceived as an idea pre-MIFID in 2006. Um, the fact that we're regulated by Berlin hasn't made, um, or by an old exchange, hasn't made a huge difference to us, but we're, we're at this point in time, although we, we could, as a regulated market, we're not actually doing product listings in the future. That's something we could entertain. And I guess, as, as uh, Mark mentioned, that gives some sort of longevity and view of stability for anybody uh, approaching a platform to decide where they would actually list an, an IPO. So with this data explosion, how do you remain elastic? How can you predict what you're going to need in the future? So, Either of you? Yeah. Um, so for us, again, as, as I mentioned, we, we came up with the idea of uh, Equiduct and a retail best execution MIFID compliant service in 2006 through to 2007. At that time, the new entrants, the number of new entrants wasn't well known, wasn't well defined. The quality of their technology and the level of uptake and, and trading on those uh, venues wasn't known. So 
all we could do is look at our experiences from implementing trading systems for Reg MS in the States, as some of the uh, early team had done, um, and also extrapolate technology expectations and the data rates that we, we would expect to come into Europe. What we couldn't have ex expected was quite such the explosion of data that occurred from 2007 onwards with the new venues having a huge amount of posting activity on them, some due to liquidity re agreements, some due to just general uptake and support by, by the members out there. Um, but what that meant for us, as I mentioned before, consuming all of that data was a huge challenge because we had these huge step changes in data that came along periodically each time a new venue uh, was launched. So what it meant for us was that our original design patterns we implemented in terms of working out how you can logically segment the business flows that you need, typically for equities, that's at the instrument level, it's fairly simple, um, but you then have to have the design from the network level up to be, allow you to scale and uh, cater for those peaks and capacity and spikes that come down the line at you intraday. You can't necessarily have an adaptive system that will shift of a, the state of a stock from one machine to mm. another to, to scale for that. <coughs> you, have, you have to have a certain amount of prediction of, of peak resource levels that you're going to use. So that's exactly what we did. Same for, same for you, Mark? Um, well, I'd like to say yes, and I'm happy to say I didn't have to do it. Um, from, the, from the traded markets point of view, because Zetra is managed by the Deutsche Börse, it comes down to service level agreements right. and account management and ensuring that um, when you come to capacity planning that both sides are aware of what you, what you expect to happen in your market. And that so you future peach future proofed even your your organization by going to the, the the purchase rather than the build yourself yes absolutely and ensuring that that doesn't you're not just saying okay for the next five years you'll be fine you're continually watching that you're continually meeting account management comes into it from the primary markets business point of view it is capacity planning it, it's not looking at you know hundreds of thousands or millions of trades it's looking at things like well will the regulation changes um, in, in, from the point of view of transparency or market abuse, require our members to publish more company announcements, for example? Will they have to um, generate uh, more, more bulkier listing documents? Will, be, will there be a different kind of um, document number? And therefore, how do you plan for the, the capacity of storage, the publication? It, it, it's a much smaller numbers when you're dealing with primary market information than secondary market information, but the processes are similar. Mm -hmm. it, it's to do with planning, it's to making sure you've got a bit extra and having contingency plans, etc., in place. Well, with five minutes to go, we'll throw it out to the floor again for some more lively questions and debate. Um, just one thing that I wanted to add, and I think perhaps we ought to um, think about that too, is, is that um, we're all professionals in the business, managing capacity, seeing the data increase, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there is a real problem sometimes for the client on the other side to actually themselves having the capacity to, um, to consume that, uh, that data. Um, certainly from the um, Chiax experience, we've seen the requirements of customer lines you know, multiplying almost on a six monthly basis. Um, and whilst we as a firm manage to deal with that quantity of data, you know, I think that uh, the customers themselves are, are finding it problematic um, and, and they're now beginning to cut data into different chunks, if you like, in order to, to consume that properly. Just wonder what you thought about that. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a, a, a challenge that we, we faced as well, in particular with the Market by Limit product, which, as I, I mentioned earlier, is that aggregated, consolidated book, which we then, because we're creating that tick by tick for the price determination service, when we actually publish that out as a data feed to our clients, um, they are typically the retail brokerages who will then actually pass that data on online to their online customers. So although we, as a, as a venue uh, like yourselves, have the capacity to churn out this data on a tick by tick basis, the actual usage pattern of, of the, the customers that we have was different. So the way we've solved that is actually to have a per client base conflation option. So we can conflate down to the data rates, to the bandwidths that a client can consume um, ac across all of our data products, in including our central limit order book publication there as well, which for, uh, as you mentioned, capacity reasons, we, we channelize into different instrument buckets as well. So Mark, are you chunking in the same sort of way? Um, something similar, but, but different. 
I think it comes down to not trying to force all customers to get the same product. So within the consolidated exchange feed, there are different product lines. If you are a vendor, for example, you're probably happy with CEF Core, which will have all data um, right down to the nth degree. Um, it's it's unnetted, etc. While if you are trading, particularly if you want to be in the, the HFT space, you're dealing with um, CF Ultra, which would have netted data. It would only have an order book trade, so any on exchange but off order book transactions are excluded. So to make sure that your 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 product line is sufficient to allow for the multiple customer needs that you would have, and of course align with protocols like Fix, etc., which allow them to get over some of the technical headaches and just get down to well, what is a product they need and how quickly can they get it in place? There was another question, gentleman in the pink shirt. Gentleman in the pink shirt, Alex. Simon Gibbs, <laughs> BT Radiance. I think I work for you, don't I, Alex? Uh, yes, you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not planted. <laughs> Um, I actually, um, I came in late, but I'm still curious. Um, what are the three bits, uh, just a summary really from each of you, the three bits of technology that you believe the members can use more successfully in order to get the data and uh, the technology that's actually helped them get more data or get the data in, in a way that, that they can use it? Three Sorry, bits you said the three bits that... Yeah, three bits of, of technology that you believe are helping the, the members get the data in a way that they can actually then use it. And I think you've talked about one just now. I did, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the three pieces, I think I've covered a three of them, actually, like, depending on, on who your customer is. So, if vendors, you're probably happy with core. If you're, if you're in the trading space, then you, you'd want enhanced broadcast, um, which, which is going to be quicker and have a reduced uh, information footprint. And then uh, the, the protocols themselves. Yeah, uh, uh, technology to me is, is, is part of the data, but also things like FPGA, making it faster, ultra, all those types of things, uh, networks and so on, extranets and so on. David? Certainly, so one of the aspects is the protocol which you utilize to, to ship that data to your client, and with the messaging standards out there, it certainly helps to reduce the friction cost to get that over to your customers. Um, some protocols are more efficient and better than others, some are just have just been there for quite some time, and so are just the, the protocol that you have to adopt. Um, with those spikes and the, the variations in the bandwidth, if they have a network provider who can provide them on-demand uh, overnight changes in, in bandwidth capability, then that allows them more easily to consume the data and vary that according to the, the characteristics of the data that the, each venue is, is publishing. And then um, certainly on the receipt side, we see, the, uh, as you mentioned, the adoption of the the consolidated data vendors of the of FPGA technology and as well as sort of multicast mesh networks, which is of keen interest to us as a consumer of the data. We want to receive the data in a, on as direct a path as possible into our exchange as opposed to the hub and spoke model where, such as uh, Reuters utilized, where they pull all the data into a single place, then you have to go and get that data from that hub. I'd much rather I'd need, in fact, to receive that over a multicast mesh ne network to ensure that the data path is as short as possible. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're almost at timeout. You've each got 15 seconds left, so you've got your magic wand rather than a blank piece of paper. You've got your magic wand. What would you like to solve and what would you solve it with? I'd like to solve... Um, Apart from world peace, obviously. And, you know, and hunger. Um, and hunger, yes. I think the timestamp issue is a big one. I think that would make a huge difference. If they had to just pick one thing. Any ideas on how you would solve it? You have to get all the other problems out of the way first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it does come down to universal clocks. Like mm -hmm. You're down to nuclear clocks. David, you got your magic M wand? Mine would be a business one. Uh, access to all uh, national uh, clearing houses. Access to all. Well, that segues on very, very nicely to our next panel. Well, please give a round of applause to Mark and for David. And I think David did especially well, so thank you.